A good day to all of you. Welcome to the second episode of our two-part documentary series, Our Changing Climate, Let's Act Now. Now, if you remember in our last episode, three young people from Zimbabwe, Zambia, and Malawi took us on a make-believe trip into the future to show us how much better our world would be if we act now to slow climate change. We traveled into the year 2061 to see how environments across Southern Africa can regenerate and how our countries can be world leaders in using sustainable energy sources like sun, wind, and biogas to power up our economies. The good news is that people across Southern Africa are implementing exciting projects that protect our planet and they are willing to share their experience with us. Please join me as I take you on a trip to visit five groundbreaking projects in Malawi, Zambia and Zimbabwe. Let's see what we can learn. We start our trip in Zimbabwe where we visit Lake Chivero outside the capital city Harare. Lake Chivero is a large man-made lake which is a major source of water for Zimbabwe's capital Harare. It is a wetland of international importance with over 400 bird species. Sadly, however, the lake is threatened by waste from human activity as well as by water hyacinths, an alien plant which is recognized as the third largest cause of biodiversity loss on the planet. If water hyacinths are not controlled, they block sunlight to underwater plants and can kill fish by depleting oxygen in the water. We're here to meet Jean Bertrand Mhandu. He and his team of youth activists have taken lead in getting rid of water hyacinths and pollution. Okay guys, let's go. Yes, we have to. Ah. Oh yeah. Over the years growing up, I always wanted a sense of belonging, so I started volunteering with several youth organizations into humanitarian initiatives so that I contribute to the human family because obviously I probably had a rocky background, that's what they might say. But then with there I found more engagement and more connection with nature. I breathed it, I ate it, and it became a lifestyle. Now it's more of a purpose, trying to contribute to the human family still. And, uh, I met with other like-minded people that have motivated me and told me that I wasn't insane to be more biased towards the environment and nature. And uh, with the platforms that I was getting, I got uh, more responsibility to engage and help other colleagues of mine and young people to start thinking the same way I was thinking. Over the years, we have been taking this and it's, it's actually great fertilizer for the, for the plants. This project can be upscaled and um, we can actually begin to, you know, supply other people with big farms with this organic, um, organic manure or organic fertilizer that we would have uh, made from this water hyacinth. Yeah. So, yeah. so this is one of the projects that we're going to do. We're also going to try and do briquetting. As a way of uh, reducing deforestation as well. <laughs> as an alternative source of energy. Exactly. This is an experiment that we are doing. We want to get the uh, horse dung so that we can put it uh, and mix it with the water hyacinth there. This actually improves the quality of our organic material, the end product itself. It becomes so good, so organic. So this is part of the process. We take the, uh, the horse dung, we put it there, we mix it with the hyacinth, and I think once in a while, there'll be someone who will be pouring water, making sure that uh, the mixing process is going on well. So this is what Jean is doing. So after we fill this, we take it there. Yeah, and we... we're so lucky that we have horses here at Kimbashiri, so this is quite easy for us. Yeah. But then for other communities, I'm sure you might use even the, the cows. Yeah, the cow dung can do as well. Yeah. So we then test with the vegetables that are in the garden and see which part is doing quite good, whether the hyacinth mixed with cow dung, the hyacinth mixed with horse dung, or hyacinth on its own. The 
data transfer center, this point, collection point where all the clubs, all the people around, they can come and put their waste for recycling. So we will get, say, for instance, bottles, plastic, cans, um, sorted, of course, at source because we don't want people using this as a dump, as a dump site or as a rubbish dump. So what we want to do is. Um, if we get clubs around the lake, all of them, including national parks, and bring in their bottles, their plastic, their cans, maybe they can tend, be turned into value by um, selling them to the manufacturing companies, or we can recycle them ourselves. The moment we leave this here, for instance, now it's a raining season, you will notice that it gets washed away into the lake. And at times, as you can see, if you could go a little bit Feather. You will see burrows, nets, and these fisheries are some of the people that leave out the nets and they don't take care of their waste, you know. So we have picked up so many stuff already. We have the cans, we have the plastic, we have the nets, we have paper, we have plastic. There are many bottles and some are not just left by the fisheries, they are also left by the visitors that come, because this is an amazing tourist destination, one of the prestigious ones in Zimbabwe, well known for its rhinos, for the birds, for the crocodiles, you know, for so many things. We have even facilities here where people can come out for a weekend, for a night, and have a good time. My message to, to the people, or my peers, young people that are out there is, Every tiny bit of good counts. Let's spread out the love and do something that doesn't benefit you only, but benefits the next person. Let's take care of our environment. It matters the most and give back to the community and the society. We are the leaders of now. Nobody's going to do it for us, but we are going to dictate the lives that we're going to want in the near future. From Zimbabwe, we now travel to Malawi's southern region to visit the Shire River Valley, site of Malawi's largest hydroelectric power station, which was seriously damaged by Cyclone Idai, to visit local communities which are rehabilitating forests along the riverbanks. The 402 kilometer Shira River flowing from Lake Malawi is the longest and most important watercourse in Malawi. On its journey southwards to Mozambique, it passes through Liwonde National Park and drops down through gorges and waterfalls. It supplies water for two electric power stations that provide more than 90% of Malawi's electricity. But trees have been cut down for fuel and cleared for crops along sections of the river. This is reducing the important role that their roots and natural vegetation play to protect the banks from eroding and sediment from flowing into the river during heavy rains. During floods, the roots also ensure that water sinks into the soil rather than flow above the ground, destroying crops and homes. This water then seeps back into the river helping to keep it flowing during droughts. 85% of Malawi's population rely on agriculture as their main source of livelihood, and current farming practices are unsustainable for the environment or to feed a growing population. Through a project funded by the World Bank and the Catholic Development Commission of Malawi, CADACOM, Tribal communities along the Shira River are now planting trees along the banks as a buffer between the river and the crops and to prevent soil erosion. Kadakom was a non-governmental organization, but mainly as a development arm of the church, uh, takes its belief from the fact that uh, we are stewards. And as stewards, we have the role to protect the environment. And also in comparison with the letter that Pope Francis wrote, Laudato Si, where he's calling us all to protect the environment. We encourage deforestation in two ways, through the establishment of tree seedlings, um, where we, in collaboration with the Department of Forestry, they advise us what trees are suitable. Like here you've seen 
the cashew that's being planted, uh, which is good for firewood. Uh, but also we encourage regeneration. Where in areas where there are trees that, are already, that have already acclimatized to the environment, we encourage that the communities just look after them, protect them, remove the grass so that they are protected from fire. From the Shire River Basin, we now travel to the east towards Mulanje Mountain, where we visit the Mulanje Mountain Conservation Trust that is planting 250,000 seedlings each year to preserve the forest reserves that are always under threat. Another exciting thing about this conservation trust is that they have developed an innovative cooking stove that dramatically reduces the use of firewoods. We now talk to Arnold Kaziponye who has more to say about these stoves. <laughs> These women from Mulanje rural area have something to sing about. They have been shown how to make a simple, environmentally friendly cooking stove, and so their lives have changed for the better. These women are, we are trained on the artisanal work, like the skills on how to, uh, to produce the stove itself. Uh, the stove has gone through a number of transitions uh, from the initial uh, stove that was produced then in 1996 uh, to what we now have the efficient architecture uh, zombaula. We call it efficient because we have even tested the thermal efficiency uh, that it is over 37%. So it is able to uh, help in reducing the amount of wood that one would use when you cooking, as well as a uh, reduced amount of smoke. So by using the chitete zombaula, we are looking of uh, issues to do with the respiratory uh, uh, illnesses that we are able to reduce with the use of uh, chitete And it is also cheap. Uh, to produce because the materials used to produce are locally found. You're talking of clay, you're talking of firewood, uh, and the technology itself is easier to be adopted. We have money to save on the amount of wood that is used by 50%. And the time that they are now able to save from going up uh, looking for firewood can be invested in other productive activities. It is also reliable, uh, it is also portable. Uh, I'm talking of reliability because it can stay about three, four years, cost is still using, and the price is also cheap. We also look at economic benefits. That now it's like something that we have money to empower women uh, to produce. Now they are selling. Uh, by so doing, they are generating money income into their uh, households. Over 96% of Malawians do use firewood and uh, most of them uh, they rely on going into forest reserves. So this is one of the contributors to the environmental degradation. So by using Chirete Zombaula, which uses few wood, you're talking of now issues to do with conservation of the environment. If you look at our population growth, versus uh, the environment, you'd find out there's no balance. We are growing as people, and now the environment is getting degraded by the day. So this technology is one of the technologies that has, can help to sustain the environment because it only uses a few trees, a few. So if we're talking of conserving the environment, I think Architecture Zimbabwe is one of the things that through Enabler number seven, Environmental Sustainability for Malawi 2023, we are also there promoting the same.
walk down to Zambia's Kafue Valley where we visit the Old Orchard Organic Farm where only natural and organic fertilizers have been used for the past 20 years and where they use crop rotation to prevent soil erosion. Now what we really love about this project is that over 200 farmers from across Zambia have been trained to farm in the same earth-friendly way. <laughs> Sebastian Scott, a founder of Grassroots Trust, is a passionate believer in organic farming, not only as a viable alternative for commercial farming, but also as an economically viable, sustainable way in which small-scale farmers can produce food. So organic farming, if you go to Europe, they call it ecological farming. Others call it agroecology. So it's a method of growing crops without the use of synthetic uh, fertilizers or chemicals. It's trying to be in tune with nature. So ecological farming try to copy how Mother Nature grows things and translate it into a farming system that produces uh, what we need to survive as, as, uh, as people. Yeah. The field you're looking at now, for example, this maize, uh, soybeans, we, we use intercropping. We use, use legumes in crop rotation, intercropping, livestock manure, instead of using uh, chemical fertilizers. Uh, one, because of the cost. I mean, one of the major things for farmers in Zambia, they, they feel they can't advance because they don't have access to enough fertilizers, which is the, the farming they know. So it kind of limits them in expanding their, their business. So we're saying, no, you don't have to rely on fertilizers solely. You can also do, uh, you know, natural farming with legumes, animal manures, and get very high yields. You can see behind me how the crops are looking, even though they haven't had any chemicals at all, any fertilizer, any sprays of, for pests of any kind, but still we're going to have very good crops. Chemical fertilizer has a negative impact on the biology of the soil, although it can increase nu nutrients in the, in the field. I mean, I, I wouldn't be someone who says chemical fertilizers don't work but they have a negative impact on the soil and their production takes a lot of energy. The contribution of, of fertilizer production and transport and use in the world has a very big impact in terms of climate change in, in, in its uh, emission of carbon into the atmosphere. It's one of the major contributors, in fact, commercial agriculture. Then the other chemicals like pesticides, fungicides, they all interfere with the soil fertility. Soil is, uh, it runs as a biological process. There's the mineral component, which is the nutrients, and for those nutrients to get to the roots of the plant, they need the biology, the bacteria, the fungus, the protozoa, all the, the earthworms and the termites. So when you, when you spray insecticide, fungicide, herbicide, those are all interrupt that cycle. So as a result, your soil becomes less productive. And we all know that cost of inputs is going up steadily, more than the price of food is going up. So that leaves the farmer in a difficult position because the soil fertility is going down, but the cost of production is going up, you know? So where does the farmer end up? A lot of the children in the, in the, you know, in the rural areas looking at their parents getting poorer and poorer every year. Organic farming helps farmers uh, build their soil organic matter which helps to reduce the effects, negative effects of climate change. So in droughts, organic farmers do better. In wet years, organic farmers do better. At a lower cost, and the end result of higher yields at lower cost is what? Increased income, even in the face of climate change. You know? So that's where we're really heading. We're not saying, no, how do we deal with this? We're saying, how do we deal with this in a way we can still make more money, even in the face of climate change? for the small-scale farmers in, the, in Zambia and in the region. We are now in Waila Secondary School in Lilongwe, Malawi, where we are visiting school learners who are protecting their environment through the Waila Go Green project, which they initiated in 2020. <laughs> The Go Green project was started as a project which was initiated by Meet Africa, which is a SADC program here in Africa. And 
It is in cooperation with the Ministry of Education. One of the objects is to empower young people to improve their physical environment and address the challenges of climate change. We wanted the students to take part in taking care of the environment. And so far we have planted about almost 2,000 trees. We take care of our trees in the way that we water them intensively so that we keep the zones around the trees moist for the growth of the trees to be healthier. And we also dig around the trees and remove the grass so that we reduce the competition of nutrients between the plants and the grass so that the plants can grow health. And apart from that, we also add manure to increase the nutrient content of the soil from where the tree is growing so that the trees can grow health. It's a good thing for a school to have beautiful flowers and for students themselves to be taken care of them. And you know, as, as a school, trees are important because some of, the, some of the students, when they come here, it provides shades. You can look behind me, there's a woodlot there, which has been there, and sometimes during the examinations, students can go in such places and they, they study and we have even uh, elected some chairs around the trees so that the students can be there and make their study circles there. Students also take pride in keeping their school clean by depositing their litter and other rubbish into 12 bins placed around the grounds. While a secondary school is committed to its Go Green project and schools around it are learning from its example. Community members have also donated a boho to the school, which enables learners to water their trees and shrubs and to create a student vegetable garden. We have now come to the end of our trip to see firsthand what inspiring pioneers are doing to slow down climate change and protect our environment. Sign up to Sadiq White CSTO Pulse to get more information about these projects and you can also share with us your experiences. So make sure you visit www.cstopulse.africa. Let us share our knowledge and act now to end climate change. <laughs>